Chapter Twenty Four, Across the River of Time. Black sails stood out in sharp contrast to the misty horizon, rising like upswept raven wings from the surface of the gray sea, as the Druki fleet bore down on the Skinrider ships nestled in the small cove. Malice and Halclear stood at the lip of the ragged opening in the cliffside and watched the frenetic movements on the decks of the anchored vessels as the raiders prepared for action. The huge, broad-bellied ships were not meant for cut-and-frost duels close to shore. For all their seagoing power and greater numbers, they were almost helpless in their present situation. Sheep before a sleek pack of wolves. Except, that is, for the sea chain. Malice ground a fist against the rock wall. Surely they can see that the damn chain is still up. The retainer nodded grimly. Most likely they do and are expecting us to drop it at the last moment, to better surprise the raiders. But it was the Druki who were heading for a brutal surprise. With the wind at their backs, they would be forced against the iron chain and pinned there, while the stone throwers in the seawall citadels would smash them to bits. Careful not to put any weight on his aching leg, Malice leaned out from the cliff opening. Hundreds of feet below, he could see the abandoned village near the shore, now seething with bands of skin riders who had answered the call of the horns. The highborn studied the rock walls to either side and tested the strength of the wind. Far below, in the open field between the village and the abandoned stockade, he saw a smoldering shape still lick with the occasional tongue of emerald flame. There's no climbing down this, he snarled. And even if we could, the chain towers are at least two or three miles away. We would never reach them in time. Pity we can't ride on the green lightning like the skin riders can, Hawklear said ruefully. He peered down at the smoking remnants of the chieftain. Not that it seemed to work so well for him, mind. Malice stiffened. Not lightning, perhaps, but... He turned to Uriel. We need to get to the tower across the cove. What about that spell you used to get us to the Harrier? Uriel leaned wearily on his axe. The blood and magic it had drunk was all but gone now, leaving the wounded Druki pale and exhausted. He shook his head. What I did was build a bridge, he said, his voice little more than a whisper. I need a resonance with the destination. Last time I used the Osmir's connection to Bruglier to bridge the distance. You need a resonance? A connection? Malice limped quickly across the chamber and scooped a small object from the floor. He held it up, revealing a broken chunk of glossy brick. All of these towers are made from the same scavenged brick. Would that be enough? Uriel closed his eyes, concentrating on the problem. Perhaps, he said at length. Yes, it is possible, but I would also need a frame, an enclosed circle that we could step through. Malice frowned, his gaze sweeping across the room. Finally, he pointed to the opening in the cliffside. Use that, and do it quickly, time is running out. Uriel studied the irregular opening, his expression uncertain. The geometries are poor, he said. I cannot guarantee that a spell will work. If it fails, you will step through and plummet to your death. The alternative is to be marooned here, Malice snapped. The skin riders will sink or capture every ship in the fleet. Worse, they will kill every druki the sharks don't get to first. We have no other choice. Faced with the alternatives, Uriel nodded quickly and snapped orders to his surviving men, and then limped to the opening. The retainers rooted through the bodies until they found the severed head of the Norskan warrior and brought it to their lord. Uriel took the grisly trophy, inspected it like a servant buying a melon at the market, and then used his axe to split the skull in half and toss the lower section aside. Then he passed the axe reverently to one of his retainers and went to work, dipping his fingers in the Norskan's brain pan and daubing crimson sigils around the rim of the opening. When he was done, he held out his hand for the piece of brick. Malus handed it over and surveyed his meager force. Uriel's two surviving men were unhurt, 
and despite having to conceal himself in the stinking circuit of a skin rider, Hawklear seemed none the worse for wear. Bruglier's surviving retainer had spent several minutes whispering over the body of his fallen captain, before rising silently and taking his place along the rest of the party. Six men to storm a citadel, he thought. It would have to be enough, somehow. Uriel held a segment of the Norskan skull in both hands and began to chant. At first nothing happened, and then a single trembling tendril of steam rose from the brain pan, flowing towards the opening as though drawn by the wind. The tendril waxed and waned in strength, spreading blood and brain across the pane of sorcery until a thin red sheen gleamed across the rough opening. Malus frowned. Something didn't look quite right. For one thing, he could still clearly see the grey sky beyond the faint membrane. Quickly now, Uriel hissed, his voice tight with strain. I cannot hold this for long. The highborn felt a touch of dread. It was one thing to speak boldly of a blind leap of faith, and another thing entirely to come upon that last moment a step. And then another thought struck him. What if the spell was only an illusion? What if Uriel saw this as an opportunity to eliminate him? Are you certain that the bridge is established? Malus said. Of course I'm not sure, Uriel shot back. No hurry! No time for doubt, Malus thought, drawing his bloody sword. If the spell doesn't work, we're likely dead anyway. Taking a deep breath, the highborn ran forward, gritting his teeth against the pain in his leg and leapt into the opening. He stumbled across the heaving plain of blood under a raging crimson sky. Howls of the damned filled his ears. Malus looked over the shoulder and saw a black tower rising in the distance just before a wave of searing cold washed over him. Malus fell, rolling across a rough stone floor littered with refuse. Hoarse shouts echoed around him, sounding surprised and angry. The highborn rolled onto his back. He lay on the floor of a circular chamber, its stone walls slick with slimy moss. A crumbling stone stairway rose alongside the outside of one of the walls, rising to a partially collapsed ground floor and an open doorway that led somewhere outside. Just a few feet away, he could see a faint crimson oval shining in the dimness, wavering and insubstantial. The spell had worked. And then Malus heard shouts and heavy footfalls, and remembered that he wasn't alone. He rolled quickly to his feet, sword in hand, and realized with a start that the Dark Mother had blessed his audacious plan. He was just a few feet away from an enormous capstan, not unlike the ones used to haul in ship's anchors, except it was far bigger. Massive lengths of rusty chain were wound around a huge wooden drum. Uriel's spell had taken him directly to the sea chain. The rest of the chamber was heaped with bits of broken wood and piles of rubble from the collapsed floor above. When Malus had arrived, there were skin riders loading rubble into a large basket suspended from a rope and pulley system running through the gaping hole above. More ammunition for the stone throwers at the top of the tower, the highborn surmised. Now the raiders had recovered from the shock of the sudden arrival and rushed at him with everything from swords to broken bricks. There was an electrical crackle and the thud of a body behind Malus, and the charging skin riders pulled up short at a sudden flare of magic. The highborn took advantage of their hesitation and charged at them. The blade flashed, slicing through the skull of one raider, and he stepped over the corpse's body and swung at the next man in line. The skin rider blocked the cut and fell back with a startled shout, piling into the men behind him. Malus pressed his advantage, hammering at the raider's guard until he was able to draw the man off balance and bury the sword in the skin rider's neck. The keen edge split the man's spine and left his head hanging by little more than a strip of flesh and diseased muscle. Dismayed by the ferocity of the highborn's attack, the surviving skin riders broke and ran for the stairs, shouting an alarm to the other men somewhere above. Malus chased them all the way to the base of the stair, and then turned at the sound of a sharp thunderclap to find Uriel and the three surviving retainers staggering over to the capstan. 
Look for a lever to release the chain, Malus cried. No need, Uriel said wearily, pushing the retainers aside. He raised his axe over his head and spoke a word of power, and then brought the blade down on the taut chain. The iron links parted like soft cheese, and the unwound links disappeared through the chute in the wall with a thunderous rattle, followed by the churning splash in the sea outside. Ears ringing, the druki looked at each other, unsure what to do next. How clear blinked like an owl. Well, he said, that was easy. No sooner had he spoken that the entire tower shook beneath a tremendous blow. A section of the wall just above ground level blew apart, showering the druki below with jagged stones and enveloping them in a pall of gritty dust. Malus whirled, coughing in the dust cloud and heard something large slither wetly through the opening. Peering into the haze, the highborn caught a glimpse of two pinpoints of greenish light rushing at him, and leapt to one side barely in time to see a seething mass of shifting flesh landing in the spot where he stood. The demon was a pulpy mass of melted bodies, welded together by magic and supernatural will. Arms and legs protruded haphazardly from the pulsating mass. Some hands still clutched corroded weapons, while others grasped spasmodically at the air. Distorted faces gaped and moaned across the yellow-brown mass. As the highborn watched in horror, the shape contracted producing a head at the top of a thick neck of maggot-ridden flesh that rose above the amorphous body and vomited a stream of brown bile at Uriel and his men. Uriel brought up his axe in an instinctive move, and the arcane weapon blazed with light, deflecting the spray away from the wielder. Uriel's two men were not as fortunate as their master, though. They howled in agony as the acid splashed across them, melting armor, cloth, and flesh with horrifying ease. Without thinking, Malus threw himself at a demon, slicing a deep cut into the fleshy mass that oozed steaming bile, but otherwise seemed to have little effect. The long-necked head, still dripping bile from its malleable jaws, snapped around and regarded him with blazing eyes. The creature's body bulged and long tentacles studded with jagged bits of teeth burst from the mass wrapping around Malice's waist and throat. There was a wild scream of fury from the other side of the demon, and Bruglier's man clambered onto the creature, running up onto the monster's side and swinging the blade at a towering neck. The thick cord of muscle parted in a fountain of acidic bile, and the head bounced wetly across the floor. At that, the creature's entire body seemed to recoil, hurling the frenzied retainer into the air, and then it gave a huge spasm and lunged at the airborne druki with a giant maw like a frog snapping at a fly. It swallowed the man whole, and Malice grimaced at a sizzling sound, as the monster's stomach juice dissolved the man in a few seconds. The highborn slashed his sword through the tentacles around his throat, the blade slicing through them like they were pliable vines. The ropey tendrils around the wrist constricted, drawing him closer to the monster. Malus saw the skin near the tendrils bulge, and a new head began to emerge from the depths of the creature, green eyes burning with hatred. Gangrenous skin stretched like a coal as the head pushed free of the demonic mass. Its mouth opened and uttered an agonized scream as Uriel buried his own enchanted blade in the monster's body. Sensing the opportunity, Malus reached forward and grabbed the taut tendrils pulling at his waist and used them to haul himself even closer to the demon, thrusting forward with his sword at the same time. He stabbed the creature right between its fiery eyes, and a jolt like lightning shot up his sword arm, throwing him back onto his back. There was a hideous crackling sound like popping grease, and the demon's fleshy body lost its stability, melting into a spreading pool of bile and rotting flesh. Staring at the ceiling, the highborn saw a pall of greasy yellow mist rise from the body, and fly like a tattered wraith through the gaping hole in the wall above. Moments later, a pair of strong hands grabbed Malus by the arms and pulled him upright. Hauklir was breathing heavily, covered in brick dust and bleeding from a cut on the forehead. The highborn jerked loose of the retainer's grip. Your timing could have been better, he snapped. 
That thing nearly turned me into paste. An unforgivable breach of duty, my lord, Hauglier muttered darkly. Part of the wall fell on me, and I selfishly tried to free myself instead of immediately coming to your aid. Just help me up. Grunting painfully, Hauglier managed to drag Malus upright. Uriel was already staggering up the splintered stairway, the ichor of the demon still smoking from the edges of his axe. The highborn pushed away from his retainer's steadying hands and started after his half-brother. What was that image that flew up from the demon's body? Malus asked as he clambered up the stairs. Something that ought not to be, Uriel answered, his voice troubled. He reached the open doorway and looked out over the cove. Malus reached him a moment later and took in the scene unfolding before him. The sea chain had fallen, and the druki wolves were among the herd. Six nimble corsairs, a seventh was sinking at the mouth of the cove, hauled through by stones from the towers, slipped past the huge skin rider ships, loosing their heavy bolts at point blank range into the hulls of the enemy ships. The heavy steelheads punched fist sized holes in the waterline of the raiders, opening their lower decks to the sea. The skin riders responded with showers of arrows and bolts of their own, but their heavy war engines could not be brought to bear on the corsairs at such close quarters. Already two of the enemy ships were sitting low in the water as their holds were slowly flooding. Bodies and debris already littered the surface of the cove, and here and there Malus saw churning splashes in the water as the sharks began to feed. The butcher's bill will be steep, but we got a good chance of winning, Malus said grimly. The confines of the cove favor us, and Bruglier's corsairs know their work well. No, Uriel said bleakly. We are doomed, each and every one of us. The fatigue and the fear in Uriel's voice brought Malus's head around. He pointed a bloodstained finger at the outskirts of the abandoned village on the far side of the cove. Malus squinted, trying to make out details of what was happening at the shore. At first he could make nothing but a huge crowd of skin riders, and then he realized that none of them were moving. They were frozen in place, as though held in the grip of an unseen fist. Then he saw a flash of greenish fire among the raiders and realized what was happening. The demon, he said. It's using the skin riders to make another body. Uriel nodded, expression dark. It shouldn't be possible. The spirit should have been hurled back into the outer darkness when the first vessel was destroyed. But something is allowing it to remain here, rebuild its strength and strike again. There are just the three of us left, and my power is almost exhausted. It will keep coming until we are dead, and then it will slaughter everyone in the fleet. They are helpless to stop it. It is the island, Malus realized. The Tower of Eradorius. The words died in Malus's throat. Now he remembered why the bricks in the citadel, and here in the seawall tower, look so familiar to him. Moving as if in a dream, he knelt, groping among the broken bricks lying on the floor. He found one that was mostly intact and turned it over in his hands until he found a symbol carved in the surface. Uriel watched the highborn with a bemused frown. What are you talking about? Malus traced the inside symbol with his thumb, feeling a fist of ice settle in his gut. Do you recall that I told you that I sought the Isle of Morhot to find an item hidden in a tower there? The tower was built by a sorcerer named Eradorius. He held up the brick. And the skin riders tore it down to build their damn citadels. With a sudden burst of rage he hurled a stone across the chamber. Who knows, it might have been nothing more than ruins for hundreds of years before the raiders even arrived. We're never gonna know now. Or what happened to the cursed idol, the highborn thought. For the first time since Tsarkhan stole his black soul, Malus felt utterly lost. What does that have to do with the demon? The tower was built to escape another demon, 
Eradorius used his sorcery to create a sanctum that was outside space and time. He created a place that was a realm unto itself, separate from all the others. He pointed outside. That demon wasn't hurled back into the outer darkness because its pull cannot reach him here. No doubt it's why it's picked this island to begin with. Uriah looked at Malus as though he were mad. But you just said the tower was destroyed long ago. The tower stood outside time. It was set apart. The highborn's voice trailed off as his eyes widened in realization. Outside time, of course, it's on the shore of the river. Hauklir clambered up beside Malus and peered carefully into his eyes. I think you need to sit down, my lord, he said wearily. You may have taken a hard knock to your head. Malus pushed the retainer away. The tower was placed in a realm beyond the reach of time and space. It still exists in a sense and the idol is still there. He reached for Uriel. When we crossed from the chieftain citadel to here, you saw the red plain, the tower on the horizon. You think that was the tower you speak of? Yes, I do. He paced up and down, one finger tapping meditatively on the chin. It was all there, right in front of me all along. Why didn't I realize it before? He turned back to Uriel. You have to use your sorcery to send me there, now. But, but the resonance. Malice gestured at the scattered bricks. We have all the resonance we need. Uriel shook his head. You don't understand. The, the place you're speaking about is not of this world. It sits on a nether plane, if you will rather than sitting at the other end. He paused, his face suddenly weary. I can open a door and send you through, but it will have to be held open on this side for you to return through, and I don't know how long I can hold such a portal open. If it fails, you'll be trapped there for all time. And how is that any worse than being eaten alive by that vile thing? Malus pointed to the distant village, where the demon was still consuming the skin riders. Open the gate. I'll take my chances on the other side. If I'm successful, the power binding the demon here will fail, and it will be drawn back into the outer darkness. This is our only chance. Uriel seemed about to argue more, but one brief look at the chaos on the far shore convinced him otherwise. Very well he said hollowly, and headed back down the stairs in search of blood. You mentioned an idol, my lord, Hauklir said quietly. How will we know to find it? We? No, Hauklir, you're staying behind. The retainer squared his shoulders. Now, see here, my lord. Malice cut him with a curt wave of the hand. Be still and listen. You must stay behind to watch over Uriel, he said quietly. If he means some treachery, I'll be helpless to stop him, so you must be the knife at his back. There's also the skin riders. He pointed to the upper floors of the tower. They may think us dead after the demon's attack, but then again they may not. If they come down here, you'll have to hold them off long enough for me to return. The retainer clearly didn't like what he was hearing, but there was little he could do about it. Very well, my lord, he growled. And what if you don't return? If it were me, I take my chances with the sharks. You think I can swim to one of our ships? No, I think you should jump in the water and hope the sharks get you before the demon does. There was no shock of icy cold or sense of dislocation. Malice stepped through the portal, and it was as though he walked into the land of nightmares. The ground heaved beneath his feet, and the sky churned overhead. The wind cried and moaned in his ears, but he couldn't feel it against his skin. He looked back over the shoulder, and saw the oval of pearlescent light floating in the air. Some kind of iridescent mist curled from its edges, 
and somehow the highborn could sense how fragile it was, like a bubble that could burst at any moment. He could just make out the figures of Uriel and Hauklir standing before the doorway. Malus raised his sword in salute, and then turned his eyes to the dark horizon where the tower stood. It was tall and square, its glossy black surface gleaming under the directionless light which permeated the nether realm. The tower seemed far more solid than the chaotic landscape around it, like an island rising from an angry sea. From where Malus stood, it seemed leagues distant. He took a deep breath and began to run. The terrain flashed by beneath his feet. His weariness was gone, and the pain in the wounded leg had vanished. Then he realized with a start that Sarkhan was no longer curled like a viper in his chest. The thought almost caused him to stumble. Was it possible, he thought, could I have found a realm where he truly cannot reach, as Eradorius believed? Laughter echoed like thunder from Malus's body, loud enough to send a tremor through his bones. Foolish little Druki, the demon said. Look at your hands. Malus stopped. With a growing sense of dread, he held up his hand and saw the dark gray skin and pulsing black veins writhing like worms at the wrist. His nails, not quite talons, were black and sharp. The strength he felt was Tsarkhan's. The demon hadn't disappeared, only spread through every part of his body, rushing through him like blood. You see, the demon said. Here I am suspended between your pitiful world and the storms of chaos that empower me. Sarkhan's awareness rumbled through him. I could have never reached this place from my prison. You were my bridge, in a sense. The demon chuckled. Yes, this place pleases me. I could remain here for a very long time. Malus fought the urge to suppress a surge of terror. And trade one prison for another? Let's just get the damned idol and be done with it. Why, Malus, if I didn't know any better, I would think you were tiring of my company. The highborn ran on. The ghosts of his dreams awaited him in the shadow of the tower. They clawed their way free of the clotted bloody earth reaching for him with clawed bony hands, flailing tentacles, or barbed hooks. Some were human, some were elven, many were twisted monstrosities from the sorcerer's nightmare. They crawled, leapt, flapped, and slithered towards him as he ran across the plain. A skeletal human with white parchment skin and a mane of snow-white hair reached for his throat. Malus swung his sword through the rave's head, and the figure wavered like smoke. An undulating mass of blue-veined flesh slithered across the ground and wrapped a thorny tentacle around his leg. The needle-like spikes pierced layers of leather and flesh with ease, leaving the flesh icy and numb. He snarled and slashed downwards, and the blade passed harmlessly through the creature. What are these creatures, demon? he said. They are the lost, Tsarkhan replied. Beings who found themselves thrown upon the shores of the island. When they died, their ghosts remained. Now they hunger for your life force, Dark Blade. They haven't had such a sweet morsel in a very long time. The skeleton's hands closed around his throat. Malus aimed a cut at its body only to have a withered elven prince grab his sword arm and trap it against its armored body. Something locked its jaws on his leg, biting through armor and robes. The cold was seeping inexorably through his body now, sapping his strength. He could hear his heartbeat hammering in the chest. What can I do to stop them? He cried as he struggled in their grasp. Why, Malus, my beloved son... The demon whispered, You have but to ask for my help. The ghost pulled him off his feet. He fell beneath a sea of grasping hands and snapping jaws. A creature like an octopus slithered onto his chest and wrapped its tentacles around his face. 
Its jade-green eyes glittered with malevolent intelligence. Help me, damn you! Malus cried. Tentacles pushed past his lips and crawled over his tongue. Help me! And so I shall. A new wave of cold roared through him, not the icy touch of the ghosts, but a flood of black ice that surged from his chest and spread through the rest of his body. Dark steam rose from his pale skin, and frost crept along the length of his blade. The ghost recoiled, all save the octopus creature, which could not unwind itself swiftly enough. Its skin blackened and its eyes turned pale blue, and it let out a whistling shriek before Malus struck it with his hand and shattered it into pieces. The white-haired skeleton recoiled from him, arms raised as if to shield itself from harm. Malus leapt to his feet with a roar and slashed his blade through the ghost's chest. The body blackened in an instant and shattered as it hit the ground. The highborn caught the elven prince in full flight. He laughed like a madman and slashed the prince across the back of the neck. Everywhere the ghosts were in retreat, receding from him like a ripple in a pond. He slew a one-eyed bear, stabbing deep in the creature's flank, and then ran down two human sailors who cried for mercy with faint, piteous voices as his sword severed their heads. Just beyond the sailors ran a druki corsair. Drunk with slaughter, Malus leapt after him, smoking sword held high. The corsair looked over his shoulder at his pursuer, his dark eyes wide with terror. Malus recognized the scarred form at once, but the withered face was a cruel mockery of Tanifra's fierce visage. The sight brought Malus up short, reminding him of the reason he had come to this accursed place. He watched her stumble across the broken land for a moment more, and then shook his head and resumed his journey to the tower, more determined to reach the idol than ever before.